Totally break, beating Kartik over there from the other side. I'm me because I had two for three. He got me once. Uh, DevOps Days comes from our sponsors and our organizers. A lot of work from the organizer side and can't do it without our sponsors. And we had three uh, silver sponsor shout outs to uh, get done. PagerDuty. PagerDuty, a lot of folks here in the DevOps crew use them. Agile Incident Response Solution that integrates with IT ops and DevOps monitoring stacks to improve operational reliability and agility. PagerDuty streamlines the incident management lifecycle by reducing noise and resolution times with hundreds of native integrations and operations tools, automated scheduling, advanced reporting, and guaranteed reliability. PagerDuty is trusted by over 7,000 organizations globally to increase the business and employee efficiency. Try PagerDuty at pagerduty.com. Woo! Made it. Sonatype. Uh, Sonatype is a rugged uh, DevOps mission. Their solution accelerates software innovation and quality while reducing waste and risk. Derek Weeks from Sonatype is here to give an Ignite talk on Tuesday. Be sure to ask him how to integrate Sonatype's Nexus software supply chain solution with Jenkins, Docker, Jira, Bamboo, Sonar, IntelliJ, and other tools you use. I've used Sonatype um, several times, and it's great. Uh, Zenos, right here in town. Zenos is based in Austin and a global leader of hybrid IT monitoring, trusted by 35,000 organizations worldwide. With Zenos, you can give, gain timely and actionable insight into service health across your physical, virtual, converged, and cloud environments. By integrating with tools throughout the IT lifecycle, Zenos helps organizations bridge DevOps and IT ops and succeed with continuous delivery. Learn more at zenos.com and talk to them. In the, uh, they're also in the sponsor area. So thanks to our silver sponsors. <laughs> All right, uh, next up, Kevin Berg. Kevin Berg is at He's at Sauce Labs. Uh, I'm at Alien Vault, and we use Sauce Labs quite a bit, and so I'm really excited to hear from him. I'm a music geek. Kevin is a music academic getting his PhD in music uh, just down the hall here at UT. So let's welcome, uh, welcome Kevin, and let's learn about Sauce Labs. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, excited to be part of DevOps Days. Um, today we're going to talk about cross-browser testing, so let's try and have some fun here. So uh, uh, I'm an automation specialist. I work on a professional services team. Uh, why that's relevant is uh, every day I work with customers helping to transition from uh, running on uh, either a local machine or a local Selenium grid, moving those tests, uh, to running on a cloud-based Selenium grid where uh, it's easier than ever to, to run on a myriad of, of environments, any browser you want, and, and some of the complications that that can, that can, that can cause. Um, right, um, a lot of t custom frameworks, tests, scripts, uh, a lot of custom features for uh, customers. And also I do Selenium and Appium workshops. Uh, we're getting a training program off the ground, and I've been working as a, a technical subject matter expert on that kind of stuff as well. So what are we going to do today? First, uh, we're going to be talking about automated testing. We're going to do a quick Selenium overview refresher for anybody who's, who's uh, not super familiar so that uh, the rest of the, the talk makes con has context. Uh, we're going to go over the problem uh, in a little more detail, talk about why cross-browser testing is important. We're going to narrow down to what the actual problem is and uh, the solution, which I put in the first slide, but it's, it's more complicated than that. And uh, we'll do a quick demo and then a question and then uh, if we have time, we're going to argue about some barbecue. So, see, see, I knew I'd get that. Somebody get riled up over that. Here we go. All right, save it for the end. All right. So, Selenium. Uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar, it's an open source uh, browser automation framework. It's uh, best known for uh, mimicking user user interaction with the browser. So anything you can do, uh, a user can do, Selenium can mimic. Clicking, typing, anything you want. Uh, you can also do uh, uh, more advanced features like inserting cookies to create a testable state, authentication, all kinds of things like that. 
Um, it's used mainly for testing purposes. Uh, it supports all of the most popular browsers, including uh, Microsoft Edge that uh, came out recently. And possibly the most powerful feature of Selenium is that it has bindings for every language. So regardless of, of what language you're looking to use, there are Selenium bindings for it, even Perl, I think. So if we got Perl, that's, that's about it. That's everything there is, so. All right, so Selenium at its core is very simple to use. Um, there's just a few, uh, these are the few of the most uh, commonly used commands. Uh, you instantiate a browser, which in the, in, the, in the environment just looks like you're opening it up. Uh, the commands dot .git, you just type in the website you want to go to. Uh, find an element, so you take the browser, you search through the element uh, looking for a, with a locator. That locator is generally a, a unique ID, um, a, a class name, tag name, uh, and if you have to, a, a CSS selector or an XPath. Uh, you know, uh, unique identifiers are, are usually the way to go when at all possible. I see this guy nodding his head. He knows what I'm talking about. That's good. Um, then once you've found that element, you can interact with it by either, you know, clicking, uh, submitting. So if it's a, it's a form input, you can submit the form. Uh, there's also send keys. So if you're doing uh, 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 typing into a the classic login, you can input the username and password just by using send keys. And then is displayed is also a, a very powerful tool. Basically, it goes through several checks to make sure that that element that you're searching for is actually visible to the user who's interacting with the browser. So uh, just as a, a summary, these are the, the most basic commands. So on to the problem. So, Given our now expert level of Selenium knowledge, this is the story that I get from customers all the time. And these customers um, best not be named, but range in, in size from teams of you know, companies with 15 people to more likely teams of thousands of, of customers, so, or thousands of employees. So big to small, we hear a lot of the same story. So, Here's what we usually hear. Selenium tests are generally, they're written in Firefox uh, for a couple reasons we'll go over in a minute. And hey, our test passed, fantastic. We then decide that we need to expand our test coverage and wanna test in browsers like Internet Explorer. And then we run our tests and these same tests working perfectly in, in Firefox then fail in Internet Explorer. And then in, you know, we get angry, some words, <laughs> you're right with me, I love that. Uh, some words are said in the privacy of our, you know, wherever we need to go, and, <laughs> or not, or, not, or <laughs> we, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I work in an office like that. <laughs> the occasional expletive is, is uttered, and uh, we gotta figure out what exactly is going on. So that's what we're here to talk about today, is how to, how to, to write tests in a very, uh, consistent manner that will run across anything you want to. So, moving on. So the first thing to talk about is, is, why, is why are most Selenium tests initially written in Firefox? Well, uh, Firefox comes out of the box with Selenium. As you can see in, in the second line here, that's all it takes to, to instantiate a local Firefox driver. It, it comes out of the box. There was also, is I guess, was slash is, I'm not sure how supported it is anymore, but the Selenium IDE was a Firefox plugin where you, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes and no, it's kind of supported still, um, where you could record and play back uh, Selenium tests. Um, it, it, was, it had its upsides and its downsides. Uh, inherently, the tests were somewhat brittle being recorded and, and, and stuff, but uh, it did get a lot of testing off the ground initially with Selenium, so there was, it was a very popular feature as well as uh, Firefox, Firefox is open source, so we all know how the open source community likes to, likes to band together. Uh, one other reason, and I know that Firefox isn't the only browser that does this, but uh, if you've seen my little example here, I always like writing tests in Firefox because when you click on something, there's a little dotted line that goes around the element, and so when we're working with you know, Selenium commands, it's always comforting to know that my element is actually being clicked. So you can see that in Firefox, we get the little 
confirmation and in and Chrome, uh, the element just stays static. So anyway. So then we get to the point, well, why is cross-browser testing important? And there's a myriad of reasons, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but kind of some of the main ones. But um, from a high level, we want our product, our service, our, our data to be represented to the user in the manner in which is most effective and the manner in which we want to portray it to them. And you know, we're dealing with a medium here that that can be temperamental at times, and we're different and, and different and displays elements differently. So let's talk a little bit about why that actually is. So we have five or six different browsers now, varying in popularity, but the point is, is you want somebody to be able to go to any browser, any portal, any public library, any, anywhere, and be able to log on to your product, your service, and have a good experience. So, uh, one of the main differences in all the browsers is they all have a different uh, uh, rendering engine or layout engine. Uh, Safari and iOS use WebKit. Uh, Chrome used WebKit early on, I think. Uh, Chrome and Opera use Blink. Firefox uses Gecko, Internet Explorer, Trident, and Microsoft Edge uses the new Edge HTML. So the question then remains is like, well, why don't, why don't all these things do this? Why isn't it all the same? We all want to see our websites look the same in all these different browsers. Well, it, it's complicated because one of the main reasons, HTML and CSS are extremely complex. They're huge. There's, uh, they're complex. There's new features being added all the time. Older features are being deprecated. And we're dealing with five individual uh, rendering engines for different browsers, it's who knows what's being kept up with, who's managing it, things like that. And uh, that can lead to errors that are sometimes handled differently within each different browser. So from, from a testing purpose, the, the reason that this is kind of interesting is uh, if something's displayed differently, if perhaps one element's not, uh, is covering another element, if, if you're trying to click a button that happens to be in Chrome, you know, covered up by a different element. You're not going to be able to click that. Your test is going to fail or error out, et cetera. So even our own beloved C, uh, Sauce Labs dashboard, which 80% of our customers get their information from, does not display correctly in Chrome. And believe me, there's a JIRA ticket with my name on it. Uh, <laughs> so, so these different rendering engines also lead to uh, timing issues, which is kind of uh, at the core of what the actual problem is here. So inherently, we've been different with five different rendering engines. Some are faster than others. Chrome notably is known for being quite fast, and uh, Internet Explorer is known for, in polite terms, being not quite as fast, which is, I mean, we all like to go for leisurely Sunday drives sometimes. So. Another uh, issue that makes, uh, you know, uh, something like web testing where we're searching for elements a little trickier is a lot of modern web pages we're making AJAX, AJAX requests all over the place. A single page might be making half a dozen going to different places and we're waiting responses for different times. This is an, this is an issue when, when testing because the elements take different times to load, dynamically loading elements, things like that. Uh, can can throw a kink and 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 when we're uh, when we're searching for them, so it became obvious that when we were looking at selenium, there had to be a way to account for these. So to sum up the actual problems here that we need to uh, that we need to be able to address with our testing to make them robust, to make them consistent, to make something that's actually give, feeding us valuable information. So. With the rendering engines, page load times can vary. Um, so if we're searching for an element before the page is loaded, nothing's going to be there. Our tests are going to error out. We're going to have a bad time. So when we, when we see things like that, we see a lot of no such element errors, things like that, uh, cannot find element, elements not visible, things like that. Uh, also, a lot of the browsers handle, handle uh, pop-ups differently. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Chrome has, uh, if, when they ask for a location, if, if permissions for locations, things like that, have to be addressed differently in each browser, things like that. Um, 
As we mentioned before, elements can be hidden by other elements, so you can't interact with it if they're hidden. And, and that's where we get back to the, to the problem statement. Like with you know, uh, today's access to cloud-based Selenium grids, it's easier than ever, than ever to run tests across any browser. So we need to be able to, to figure out how to do this. All right, so here's the solution. There is a built-in mechanism within Selenium that accounts for these different loading times. Problem is that there's several different ways to do this. There's mixed reviews. The, the way they're defined is confusing. And so it's hard to know exactly which, which direction to go with these. So there are basically two different times, some might, two different ways to do this. Some might argue three. Uh, there's implicit weights, explicit weights, and the third slash that falls under explicit weights technically are sleeps. So let's go through these. So an implicit weight is, it's applied to the, to the actual browser object that's instantiated. So what it does is it continually pulls the DOM every 500 milliseconds generally searching for the presence of an element. Uh, it's very simple to, uh, to, is my mouse showing up? Yes, it is, sweet. So it's very simple at the, at the beginning. You just driver.manage.timeouts, implicitly wait. This is a, a, a happens to be Java. Um, uh, this is straight from the Selenium HQ documentation, uh, but very simple to implement. And uh, it puts a blanket wait on every single Selenium command. So no matter what you're doing, it will pull the DOM for, uh, in this case, 10 seconds, looking for an element, trying to put, uh, trying to interact with an element, everything. And then there are also explicit weights. So uh, the difference between an implicit and an explicit weight is uh, explicit weights also pull the DOM, but they wait for an element to be in a condition that is what you were looking for. So they wait for an expected condition. Uh, generally, instead of a, kind of a blanket solution, this is more of an individual used with, with elements that you know will be varied in when you will have availability to them. Uh, so an example as to how those are work, how those work. Uh, you just instantiate a new web driver wait, and then in implementing it, it's wait dot until uh, element. The condition that we're setting is we're waiting for this element to be clickable, and then this is our locator by dot ID. Now, a sleep is also technically an explicit wait because the expected condition that you are waiting for is in this case time. So this is where I found when I was learning Selenium to be very confusing because everybody, every book you read, everybody says, well, use explicit weights all the time. But uh, sleeps are explicit weights, and so it led to some very embarrassing conversations at work. But uh, now that we've got this all figured out, um, we want to use explicit weights. So this was me uh, figuring out what we're trying to do. So, we understand that implicit weights and explicit weights, they both pull the DOM, they're both returning elements. One of them essentially waits until an element is actually ready to be interacted with, and that's the key. So as a general rule, we never want to use sleeps. Thread.sleep, time.sleep, all of any of the sleeps. Uh, as uh, there's, a, there's a, a guy that everybody should, if you're using Selenium, should, should check out, uh, Dave Hefner. Uh, I, I was just listening to a webinar. His, his, uh, my favorite saying is like, even if you think you have a good reason to use a sleep, you don't. You should implement some sort of wait. So anyway, um, now here's where it gets even trickier. Uh, using implicit weights isn't really a great idea either. And I'll tell you why. The issue is that an implicit wait searches for the presence of the element in the browser DOM. Now, the issue that this can cause is that there's a point of time in which the element can be present in the browser before it is visually displayed to the user and can be interacted with. 
So while this is a smaller portion of your time, like the, the small, smaller percentage of, of this uh, actually occurring, when you're running 1,000 tests, having 50 tests that fail because of your implicit weight mechanism is not an acceptable, it's not acceptable, you're not getting effective information back from your tests. So generally, you don't want to use implicit weights either. Uh, so the, the, the golden rule here is we want to use expected weights that, explicit weights that wait for a condition that is not time. So there are, there are a bunch of conditions that you can wait for. Um, you can wait for an element to be enabled, visible, clickable, selected. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole list of 10 or 12 of them. Um, my favorite is clickable because it waits, it combines an element being enabled and visible. So I figured you're ready to go. Um, so being, as you, I, as you mentioned, I, I'm, a, I'm a musician, not a mathematician. So I'm thinking if, if one weight is really good and another weight is kind of good, let's put these together and I'll have like the perfect test setup. So the problem that I see all the time is that um, uh, people mix implicit and explicit weights. So you put a blanket weight on the driver and then you're using explicit weights to wait for specific elements. So when you do this, the short of it is that you go into an unexpected type of behavior. Uh, it depends on whether the explicit weight is longer than the implicit weight or the implicit weight is longer than the explicit weight. It's not really important. Basically what's going to happen is your tests are going to take a lot longer than they need to. So never mix implicit and explicit weights. It's another one of those things, if you think you need to do it, uh, we need to take a step back and reorganize the weights. Um, I may not have mentioned this, seriously, do not use sleeps. They are handled by different environments even differently. Uh, I just I have like five reasons not to use sleeps, so I, I subtly put it in here. Uh, and testing across a bunch of different environments, sometimes the sleeps aren't even executed correctly. So believe me, yeah, just trust me on that one. OK, so uh, we're going to use these. We've all agreed we're going to use explicit weights now. Uh, so when writing Selenium tests, there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to be wanting to implement these. So I always recommend uh, hiding it in your, your page base, your page object model base page. Um, uh, for those of you not familiar with page object models, it's just a, it's a level of, of abstraction from your tests. So for example, uh, if you're searching for a particular element and you're searching by an ID, it's uh, a best practice to abstract that actual ID data from your 1,000 tests and put it in one place so that if your ID happens to change, which happens all the time, then you only have to change that ID in one place as opposed to 1,000. So instead of instantiating this web driver weight in 100 different places. You can do it in one place, and it, you can call it and, and, and even put on the, the finding of your elements anytime you need. So this is just a, a simple example. There's a, there's a hundred ways you can do this. This is one that I like. Uh, uh, what we're doing is uh, you can see here, uh, we're defining our element uh, using a, a by which is basically the searchable parameters we're going to be looking for with this, uh, this element. Uh, this one happens to be ID. Again, we talked about class name, page name, or uh, class name, uh, uh, tag, tags, links. You, there's tons of search parameters. And then we can set up our, uh, our, our method for our waiting. Now, like I said before, I prefer to use clickable because it just gives you, it's a, it's a good first, uh, good way to go, make sure your element's ready to go. Uh, so I like it, so you can, I like to be able to specify the time that I want to wait for each individual element. Um, generally, I don't recommend uh, doing anything longer than 10 seconds because if you're waiting longer than 10 seconds for an element, there's probably another problem going on. You're not getting a response from your AJAX request, something like that. So um, I like this, You'd say if, if you don't specify a timeout, it defaults to 10, or you can set a specific one. And then uh, it, it, stands the, uh, it uh, instantiates the, the explicit weight, puts it on the element, we pass in the locator, and we've got our, our custom made explicit weight. All right, so we're gonna show you. 
Uh, I have, uh, this is a, a publicly available uh, website where we're just, this is obviously a simple demonstration, but you go to the website, we click on the button, and in a random amount of time, an element is going to be displayed. There we go. So we're going to, I'm going to write a test across 17 different environments that's going to test this page and make sure that my test pass the way they want. So I'm going to pull up the code real quick. Oh, that's not the code. There's the code. All right, is this? Yeah, not bad. Okay, so this is the, the my page. This happens to be in Java. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but these are all the different environments that I'm going to run a couple tests in. Uh, we've got Windows 7 through 10. We've got Opera, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Microsoft Edge. We have different versions of each of these. We've got OS X 10.10, 10.11 with Chrome and uh, Safari. We got versions 8, 9, et cetera. We're going to run in Linux. And just to up the ante a little bit, I'm going to run uh, in mobile browsers as well. Since it is Selenium, we can do that. Uh, we've got an Android emulator and an iPhone 6 simulator. We're going to run in those native browsers. As well as, just for a cherry on top, I've got, a couple, I've got access to a couple real devices that I can send tests to. So we're going to uh, run those on a Samsung Galaxy S4 and S5 in their native browsers as well. So just a real quick uh, Maven. Oh, not yet. I have to actually show the tests. So the tests. Uh, all we're doing is we're going to that page, driver.get. We're going to wait until that element is clickable in this line right here. And then we're going to define the element by ID. And then we're going to assert that it's displayed. Now, uh, most of you will agree, agree with this. Uh, never trust a test you don't, haven't seen fail. So just to keep everything honest here, I have a test at the bottom where I don't exp instantiate weights correctly. And that test, I mean, spoilers, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. So. Anyway, we've got these three tests. We're going to kick them off in 17 different environments. We're going to kick off 51 tests. And uh, let's see what happens, see if I put my money where my mouth is, as we said in Montana. All right. So we go to our dashboard here. OK, we see the tests going. Uh, you can see all the different environments on the side, Linux 44, Firefox 44. All of that. Uh, we've got uh, the names test, so we're expecting some of these that say test should fail to actually fail. Uh, oh, here we go. So we can drill down into one of these to see what's going on. Here's Windows 7 Opera version 12. Let's watch the video and see if our test exp uh, uh, executed the way we were hoping. So this is a, a video playback of it. So, yep, there's our page. We clicked the button. We waited for the uh, image. Oh, it was too quick for us. So let's go back to the, well, we can look at the screenshots. Um, so you can see in the last screenshot that we took as the test completed, our hello world uh, element is visible, ready to go. We confirmed that, asserted that, and our test passed. So going back and looking at uh, all the tests, you can see when the explicit weight was implemented correctly, all of our tests fail, or all of our tests pass in each of the uh, each of the different browsers. And uh, when we were expecting it to fail uh, with weights not implemented correctly, we can drill down into one of those. Well, let's see, Windows 10, Firefox 45. We can see that. Uh, watch this one. So we did manage to, oh, I don't know if we even clicked on the button in that one. Oh, yeah, we clicked on the button, then it looked for the, the hello world element immediately, wasn't, didn't wait for it, and the test failed because we couldn't assert that it was visible. So anyway. All right, so. Uh, I've got some resources here that uh, kind of go into more detail about uh, some of the, the more technical aspects of these, uh, 
uh, these weights and how to implement them. And uh, we've got about uh, five minutes if anybody has any questions. Well, yeah, I mean... Maintenance of the scripts is the question. Yeah, yeah, main, we're talking about how to maintain these, these, uh, these frameworks. Well, the, the answer to that, in my experience, is making them so that they're easy to maintain by you know, extracting all the data. You know, things are always going to be changing. You're adding new features. You're adding new tests. So, you know, just making sure that you have your page object model structure uh, set up in a way that uh, maintaining tests takes as little effort as, as possible. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Who maintains what? So who, who, means, who means the test, the, the test cases? Oh, yeah. The, the, the developer the, role, the, yeah. operations role? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, the developers write their own tests on, their, on, their, on the code that they commit. And so that way, as it comes in, the, the developers are responsible and for writing clean code, and uh, everything goes through. Thank you all for coming. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, sure. And these, these slides are available uh, through the website site at one point if you want to uh, uh, go over them and, and have access to these. Um, if anybody does have any questions, want to tell me where I went wrong, what I missed, please come see me. I'll be hanging out by the, the Soft Labs booth. Um, be happy to answer any questions or take any criticisms. Constructive, hopefully. And uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kevin.